from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Book Festival. Uh, on behalf of the Library of Congress, uh, we hope you're having a wonderful day celebrating the joy of reading here on the National Mall. My name is Carlos Lozada. I'm editor of the Outlook section at the Washington Post. The, po <laughs> the Post is a charter sponsor of the Book Festival and a longtime supporter uh, of this event since it began 10 years ago. Yes, this is the 10th anniversary of the festival. Here's hoping for many, many more. Um, I should inform you that the, um, this particular pavilion, the presentations here, are being filmed for the Library of Congress's website um, and archives, and C-SPAN is airing it on Book TV, so you should all be on your best behavior. Um, uh, please do not sit on the camera risers located in the back and uh, turn off your cell phones. Um, also, there are mics on either side here for questions during the uh, Q&A. Uh, our distinguished author this afternoon is Evan Thomas, a longtime writer and editor of Newsweek, and more pertinent for our purposes, the author of several wonderful books of um, military and political history, such as Sea of Thunder, John Paul Jones, Robert Kennedy, His Life, of course, The Wise Men, um, and A Long Time Coming about the election of Barack Obama. Um, uh, Evan Thomas is in transition from Newsweek and uh, is taking up residence as a professor of journalism at Princeton, where he's also writing a biography of Dwight Eisenhower. Um, the power of Evan Thomas's books is in his ability to really transport us, the readers, to a place and time long ago and feel not only like we're there in the chaos of battle with him, but that somehow we're seeing it in real time. Writing in the post-book uh, world back in 2007, he described the challenge in this way. How does a sedentary Washington journalist who has never seen war learn to write about it? I have never heard a shot fired in anger. I don't even like roughing it outdoors very much. How could I possibly know what it's like to fight a battle? The answer is I don't. But by talking to veterans and reading their letters and memoirs, I can try to imagine and I can walk the battlefield. For everyone here who's a fan of his work, it has been a great pleasure to walk those battlefields with him. And it is my great pleasure to give you Mr. Evan Thomas. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with all of these readers. Uh, Mrs. Theodore Roosevelt, Edith Roosevelt, was a loving and tender and supportive wife, but she knew when to take her husband Theodore down a peg or two. Uh, after the great battle of San Juan Hill, when Teddy Roosevelt charged up that hill, uh, she went to Cuba herself. And when she came back, she said to her husband, you know, that hill really wasn't that big. It was sort of a little hill. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went there. I went to San Juan Hill. And uh, it's big enough if somebody's up at the top shooting down at you. Uh, certainly for Teddy Roosevelt, July 1st, 1898 was what he called the greatest day of my life. This is somebody who had been president of the United States for seven years, but for, for, for Roosevelt, this was the day. Uh, he got up at four o'clock in the morning. He put on his cavalryman's uniform, specially ordered from Brooks Brothers. He tied a uh, bandana to cover the sun off of his back, but also because he knew it would stream out behind him when he read on his rode on his horse. Uh, Roosevelt was very good at public relations, and like a lot of great men, he always kept a reporter close by uh, to record his events. In this case, the most famous reporter of the day, Richard Harding Davis. And Davis reported that as Roosevelt bounded up that hill on his horse with the bullets flying at him, Davis wrote, no one who saw Roosevelt take that ride expected him to finish it alive. Uh, he was the only man on a horse, a huge target, well ahead of his troops. He made it up to the top of the hill. He rested for a minute, and he started down the other side. He shouted out, holy Godfrey, what fun. When he got to the top of the next ridge, he took out his pistol, a Colt 38, and he shot a fleeing Spanish soldier. Uh, and that night, he took out his little diary, and he wrote four lines. He wrote, rose at four, big battle, commanded regiment, held extreme front of the firing line. And a couple of days later, he wrote his best friend, Henry Cabot Lodge, did I tell you that I killed a Spaniard with my own hand? 
Now, Teddy Roosevelt was a true war lover. In 1886, when he was a 27-year-old gentleman rancher out in the Dakota Territory, he proposed raising, quote, some companies of horse riflemen out here in the event of trouble with Mexico. He wrote his friend Cabot Lodge, who was a congressman back in Washington, will you telegraph me at once if war becomes inevitable? In 1889, while agitating for military preparedness, he wrote British diplomat Cecil Spring Rice, frankly, I don't know if I should be sorry to see a bit of a spar with Germany. The burning of New York and a few other seacoast cities would be a good object lesson on the need of an adequate system of coastal defenses. Now, Roosevelt loved hyperbole, but he was apparently serious. He wrote Spring Rice, while we would have to take some awful blows at first, I think in the end we would worry the Kaiser a little. A few years later, in 1894, he wrote a family friend, Bob Ferguson, that he longed for, quote, a general national buccaneering expedition to drive the Spanish out of Cuba, the English out of Canada. Roosevelt wanted a war, and almost any war, against Mexico or Germany or Britain or Spain would do. In 1897, he gave a famous speech at the Naval War College. He said, all the great masterful races have been fighting races. No triumph of peace is quite so great as the supreme triumph of war. Some wars are noble, certainly necessary. World War II uh, was one. The Spanish-American War was a war of choice. Uh, in 1898, America was eager to go to war. William McKinley, the president then, called for 125,000 volunteers, and a million and a half men signed up almost overnight. The war really did some good. We did liberate Cuba, which was being oppressed by Spain. It was, at least at the beginning, a splendid little war, as the diplomat John Hay called it. But we got uh, sucked into a vicious counterinsurgency war in the Philippines uh, that lasted for four years. Uh, most people at the time couldn't find the Philippines on the map, but we lost uh, 4,000 men there, roughly the same number that we've lost in Iraq so far. I became fascinated with the phenomenon of war fever when I was writing about the Iraq war for Newsweek in 2003. I, but I decided to, to look at it, I'd go back a century, and I'd focus on three individuals who seemed to embody this. Uh, one was Roosevelt, and I'll come back to him in a second. Uh, his best friend, Henry Cabot Lodge, who really was America's first imperialist. Uh, Americans didn't like to use that word, imperialist. That was a kind of a European word. And uh, Americans were at best ambivalent about imperialism. But Lodge was the first to articulate the vision of America as an expansionist power, as a great naval power. Uh, he'd been reading uh, Admiral Mahan, uh, and he saw the United States as the natural successor to Great Britain as a dominant uh, uh, keeper of the peace. Uh, I also looked at, and I look at in the book, a flamboyant newspaper publisher who many of you have heard of, William Randolph Hearst, uh, a great character in his time. Uh, he claimed credit for the uh, Spanish-American War. He was exaggerating as usual, uh, but he certainly did his best to stir the pot and he actually went to the war himself. Uh, that day at San Juan Hill, he was about a mile away from Roosevelt. He got up in the morning, put on his scarlet tie and his hat with his scarlet hat band, and his valet prepared him a picnic lunch, and he stuffed a pistol in his belt and uh, went looking for the war. He went to the wrong place. But uh, three days later, he was on his yacht off of Santiago, and he was there for the naval battle of Santiago when the Americans sunk a Spanish battleship uh, Hearst took his launch into the shore, uh, captured 29 Spanish sailors, and required them to give three cheers for George Washington and Old Glory. He then turned these uh, captives over to the U.S. Navy and got a receipt, which he put up on the wall in his office. It was there till the day he died. I also wrote about a couple of interesting dubs. Uh, one is uh, William James, uh, who is a kind of Greek chorus in my book. James was a great early psychologist, philosopher, who understand the lure, he understood the lure of war. He understood why young men, particularly, were drawn to it. But he knew just enough to warn against it. And I bring him out periodically. He had been Teddy Roosevelt's teacher at Harvard. If only Roosevelt had lived, listened a little bit more closely to him, uh, history might have turned out differently. Uh, but it didn't. Uh, the other is Thomas Brackett Reed, a figure that, uh, that probably most of you have never heard of. He was, in 1898, the second most powerful man in Washington. He was the Speaker of the House up here. They know, called him Czar Reed, uh, a very interesting figure, very uh, with a droll wit, 
Uh, he once said, his, the definition of a statesman is a successful politician who is dead. Uh, the breakup with his friendship, he was very close friends with Roosevelt and uh, Lodge. The breakup of that friendship is one of the tragedies of, of my book. Reed could not understand why the country was so eager to go to war in 1898. He thought we had plenty of problems here at home, uh, but he was rolled by the war fever. There was, he, when he was the Speaker of the House, a riot on the floor of the House of Representatives, uh, fist fights, people throwing books. The sergeant of arms had to come break it up with a silver mace. Uh, Reed knew that he was beaten, brokenhearted. He quit, became a lawyer, died in a couple of, uh, a couple of years later. All, all of these characters are fascinating men, but the one I want to talk about just for a minute longer is Teddy Roosevelt, somebody who sucks all the oxygen out of the room, as one of my reviewers said, uh, and is one of history's uh, great characters. There's a famous photograph of Lincoln's body, Lincoln's casket, being uh, led into uh, Washington Square in New York after his death in 1865. And in the photograph, which is in the book, you can see a big mansion in one corner belongs to Teddy Roosevelt's grandfather. And in a window in the mansion, you can see two little heads. They belong to Theodore Roosevelt and his brother Elliot. And they are not only watching uh, the president's casket, but more attentive, really, to something called the Invalid Brigade, which are badly wounded soldiers, often missing a limb, who followed along behind it. Teddy Roosevelt was obsessed with wounded soldiers. As a little boy, he would dress up in rags and pretend to be a wounded soldier. Uh, as he grew up, he became obsessed with this idea of proving himself in physical danger, of testing himself uh, in boxing and hunting. Uh, uh, he went after his wife died and his mother on the same night out west to become a big game hunter. And, famously said, black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. And in his headlong way, Roosevelt became a big game hunter, and he wrote a book which he rated game, big game, by the degree of peril to the hunter. Now, all the way up through grizzly bear. But of course, the greatest game is man. And Roosevelt himself had never had a chance to test himself in this great game in combat, and he longed for a war. He was 39 years old when the Spanish-American War broke out. He had four children. Uh, his oldest son had just had a nervous breakdown. Imagine what it's like to be Teddy Roosevelt, Jr. Uh, his wife had had a uh, uh, serious uh, uh, disease in childbirth and had almost died. And yet, Roosevelt had to go to that war. Years later, he wrote his military aide, when the chance came for me to go to Cuba with the Rough Riders. Mrs. Roosevelt was very ill, and so was Teddy. It was a question if either would ultimately get well. You know what my wife and children mean to me, and yet I made up my mind that I would not allow even a death to stand in my way, that it was my one chance to do something for my country and for my family, and my one chance to cut my little notch on the stick that stands as a measuring rod in every family. I know now that I would have turned from my wife's deathbed to answer that call. The night before he enlisted uh, in the Rough Riders, his boss at the Department of the Navy, the Navy Secretary, uh, uh, John Long, wrote this in his diary. He's writing about Roosevelt. He has lost his head to this unutterable folly of deserting his post, where he is of most service and running off to ride a horse and probably brush mosquitoes from his neck on the Florida sands. His heart is right, and he means well, but it is one of these cases of aberration desertion, vainglory, of which he is utterly unaware. He thinks he is following his highest ideal, whereas, in fact, as without exception, every one of his friends advises him he is acting like a fool. And yet, how absurd all this will sound if by some turn of fortune he should accomplish some great thing and strike a very high mark. Well, years later, uh, Lodge went back to his, excuse me, uh, uh, Long went back to his diary and he wrote a little message in handwritten handwriting at the bottom of the page later ps roosevelt was right and we as friends were all wrong his going into the army led straight to the presidency now interestingly the uh war seems to have lifted some kind of burden from roosevelt it's as if the fever broke he got over his war fever as president he was a, i think a great president one of the great american presidents uh he stood up to the trusts uh, he was, and he was fairly careful on foreign policy. He did not get us into wars. He had that famous line, 
talk softly but carry a big stick. But the point is he never used that stick. Uh, he aimed it a few times, but he never, he never used it. He was, he, was, he was careful, and yet again, when, when he was finished being president, it's as if the fever came back. And when World War I broke out, Roosevelt, who was then in his late 50s, went to President Wilson and volunteered to raise a division to go fight in France. And uh, Wilson, who didn't like Roosevelt very much, was wary of this and not about to make a martyr out of Roosevelt or make him a hero again, so he said no. And as uh, Roosevelt was leaving the White House, he said to Wilson's top aide, Colonel E.M. House, uh, doesn't the president, after all, after understand, after all, I'm only asking to die. And House, who was fed up with Roosevelt by this time, paused and replied, oh, did you make that point quite clear to the president? Uh, unable to go himself, Roosevelt sent his four sons. Uh, they all saw action. Three were wounded. A lot of action, actually. Uh, it was a generational thing. Roosevelt felt that every new generation should experience this essential test. When his eldest son was wounded in action, he and his wife hurled their wine glasses into the fireplace. But then, in uh, July 1918, the youngest Roosevelt son, Quentin, was killed, shot down and killed when he was flying his warplane against the Germans over France. And uh, interestingly, that Roosevelt's got the axle to the plane and brought it back to Oyster Bay and uh, hung it over the mantle, kind of a ghoulish, this black bent piece of metal, uh, kind of a ghoulish monument to their son. It's there today. Uh, Roosevelt, though, was changed by this. He sat there day after day pretending to read a book, mouthing the nickname of his youngest son, Quenty, Quenty, and uh, staring blankly. Uh, the romance of war at long last had given way to heartache, and within six months, Roosevelt was dead. War will be with us, and there are times when we'll have to fight, hopefully as uh, bravely as all those Roosevelts did. Teddy Jr., that neurotic little boy that I mentioned earlier, he was the only general officer to land in the first wave at D-Day at Utah Beach. Using a cane, he led an attack on a German position and won the Medal of Honor a medal that his father had lobbied for but never won. Uh, Bill Clinton actually finally gave it to him posthumously. And so it goes, generation after generation. Let me just end with a couple of thoughts I ran into while I was researching this book. One is from Paul Fussell, author of the wonderful book, The Great War in Modern Memory. Fussell wrote, every war is ironic because every war is worse than expected. The other is from Robert E. Lee, it is well that war is so terrible lest we grow too fond of it. Thank you very much. Sir. You mentioned Teddy Roosevelt being a lover of war, and you titled the book Rush to Empire. Did Teddy Roosevelt have a vision of empire? Uh, how did he see the United States? Did he, do you think that he saw the United States as an empire in a way that other presidents and great Americans didn't? He did have a notion. Again, this word empire is not a word that Americans like. That was an old world notion. That's what the, the Germans and the French and the British talked about empire. What they, they talked more benignly about the large policy. And they was expansionist. It was they wanted to build a Panama Canal, as Roosevelt actually did during his presidency. Uh, they acquired coaling stations for our new Navy and they annexed the Philippines. But Roosevelt was a good politician, and he knew that there is a lot of ambivalence in this country about imperialism, uh, as there was at that time. And there was a brief flurry of it, but then we pull back. America has a big isolationist streak, and we were isolationist again. Now, World War I breaks out, we go to war again. But then, in the 30s, pull back, and there had been this kind of back and forth uh, really not until after World War II, when we had no choice and we were the Pax Americana, did Americans sort of take on this, this uh, uh, empire, if you will. Uh, Roosevelt, interestingly, it wasn't so much annexing territory as that he thought that war and adventurism and new frontiers were good for the American spirit. He thought that Americans had become soft and over-civilized, as he put it, and that we needed to find what he called the wolf rising in the heart and that conquest was good for our country. Now, he can sound sort of out there, certainly by our modern standards, but a lot of people were with him at this time, and there's no question that he himself had this, 
this uh, warlike spirit. Whether he was good for the country, again, I think he was a great president. Uh, I think the warlike side of him, I'm sort of glad he got it out of the system before he became president. Uh, you said that uh, he never used the big stick. What about Panama, getting Panama? Didn't he use our naval force? Well, he, we way? never actually fought a war. We staged yeah. a phony coup in Panama. It was pretty outrageous, certainly by modern standards. Uh, we created an incident that let us move in there. Uh, by use the big stick, I mean the battleships weren't firing guns, the armies weren't marching, but uh, uh, certainly uh, we, as the, what was the joke, we took the, the pan we took the canal fair and square. We didn't actually take it fair and square. We did it in an underhanded way, and that was, like that was pretty imperialist. He lifted the big stick, but he never brought it down. Right. Yeah. He, he waved the stick, but he never brought it down. Did Lodge uh, have a future uh, role in the uh, Roosevelt administration? Lodge uh, remained a senator and was a great uh, friend and uh, source of wisdom and kind of advocate for Roosevelt on Capitol Hill. Interestingly, they diverged a bit. As Roosevelt as president was more liberal, really. He wanted to stand up to the trusts and big business. Lodge was more of a traditional conservative Republican uh, business-oriented type, and the two although they always remained the dearest of friends. And, and Lodge broke down and wept at Roosevelt's, giving the eulogy at Roosevelt's funeral up here in the Capitol Dome. On policy grounds, they were not on the same page. Uh, I've enjoyed your work, both books and especially in uh, Newsweek. Thank you. And I wonder if you could comment on the future of Newsweek in particular and news magazines in general. Sure. Well, Newsweek, as you, as some of you, but probably all of you know, was sold by the Washington Post Company uh, this summer uh, to a guy named Sidney Harmon, who's uh, 92 years young. Uh, he's actually uh, full of pep and, and energy, and I think that he's going to be a reviving force at Newsweek. I think he's going to spend some money. I think he's going to bring in some good people. I think Newsweek has got some good days ahead of it. Let's see. Which, I guess I'm on this side. Uh, questions concerning uh, Roosevelt's trust busting. Uh, who who were his, his legislative supporters during that period? Uh, Roosevelt, actually, it's interesting. Uh, we think of him, I've just portrayed him as a guy who goes charging up the hill. He was pretty good at compromise. And he did, he, he did not go that far. In the, uh, you know, he was urged by the, by the all-out progressives to go all the way and bust up the trust. He did it slowly, somewhat carefully. He showed a kind of restraint and an ability to compromise that, frankly, I wish that we had today. Uh, he was somebody who actually could make a deal, even though we think of him as this headlong, headlong character. Well, did he have any key, key senators or uh, congresspeople? Uh, I don't think so. Would, uh, uh, this is not my, my period. My period is the earlier period. But I think that the, the important thing is that he, would make, he was willing to make a deal with anybody. Thank you. Do you think Roosevelt was motivated consciously or unconsciously by a political future, like being governor of New York when he went off uh, to Cuba to fight in the war? Well, let me put it this way. Did he have a political ambition? Within two days after returning from Cuba, he was meeting with the head of the Republican Party in New York. So it was on his mind. Right. Uh, and Lodge was writing him letters saying, hey, you can have anything you want. So sure, he was politically ambitious. Is that why he went to war? No. He went to war to prove himself. But the politics followed close behind. And when he ran for governor that fall on the campaign train, he had his Rough Riders with their hats hooping and hollering and playing Happy Days is here again. He, he played up that Rough Rider stuff to the hilt, and it worked. Thank you, sir. Sir, in your opinion, um, what possessed Roosevelt to go on that very dangerous adventure in the Amazon? Well, that's a good question. Roosevelt, as a fairly old guy, went on an impossibly dangerous, uh, really reckless mission. Uh, there's a wonderful book about it called River of Doubt. Um, uh, up, uh, an unnamed uh, up in the Amazon basin. He almost died there. He went with one of his sons. His leg became infected. Roosevelt actually said, leave me behind, let me die. And his said, son said, no, we're going to have to carry you out anyways. So you're, <laughs> you're coming with us. Do you think that if Roosevelt had been elected president in 1912, we would have entered uh, World War I before 1917? Uh, would we have entered World War I before 1917 if Roosevelt had been president? Absolutely, uh, as fast as he possibly could. He was an early interventionist, all for preparedness. Uh, he and his circle were constantly agitating. 
uh, to intervene on behalf of uh, England and France. Yeah, in your book, uh, Sea of Thunder, did you have any problem uh, having access to the Japanese archives? Yes, uh, I, in my book, Sea of Thunder, is about the Pacific War, particularly about the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And I tell it from the American side, but also from the Japanese side. Uh, one reason why you don't see more of that is most of the Japanese archives burned. Uh, there is some stuff, and there are some Japanese scholars. I went to Japan with my wife. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to uh, uh, really Japanese naval historians. Uh, there, is, there, there, are, there are some records of the Japanese fleet. They are pretty cryptic. Uh, what was more useful to me to find some, I actually found some survivors of the Japanese Imperial Navy, uh, one of whom was standing next to one of my Japanese heroes during the great battle. And uh, my wife and I bought him lunch. He insisted that we rent the restaurant. Uh, cost, remember, it cost us 400 bucks, so I was hoping that this interview was going to work out. It did. Uh, the Japanese are sometimes a little slow to talk, very formal. But once he got going, he relived that battle, including taking off his shoe and socks. So he, had been a, he was on the battleship Yamato, so that I could feel the 27 pieces of the battleship Yamato that were still in his leg. That's about as uh, close as you can get to wor World War II these days. Did, did the uh, Japanese actually burn uh, a lot of the records themselves? They didn't. No, no, we burned them. Our okay, bombs the burned bomb, them. Okay. Uh, uh, when we firebombed Japan, uh, that was the end of a lot of those records. They, they didn't burn them. Their rec the, the Japanese, interestingly, are all about not being too critical. And so their biographies are very careful not to speak ill of the dead. They speak very circumlocutiously. And it's rather hard to find out what the Japanese Real, really thought uh, about their own their own side. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. This, this will be our last question. Thank okay. you. How effective do you believe the tour of the Great White Fleet was at enhancing our national security? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, famously put together the Great White Fleet uh, towards the end of his presidency. Uh, sent them. Uh, I, I, the, the joke was that uh, he got Congress to appropriate enough coal to send them halfway around the world, knowing they'd pay to bring it back the other way uh, if they had to. Um, it certainly was a demonstration of American power. We showed it a little bit in the naval battles at Santiago and, and uh, Manila Bay. Uh, the Japanese sure noticed uh, when we arrived there with our fleet. I think it was, it was announcing that America was a great power on the world stage. And it was a show. It was a show of force. But I think that uh, people were paying attention. I know the British were. That was the early days of the special relationship. And I think the British could see that we were a partner in this great Anglo-American alliance to rule the seas, I think they probably also suspected that one day we would replace them. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.